we are here with an extremely special guest, Mr. Mike McMahon. How are you? Hey, I'm good. I'm extremely good and special. <laughs> that's that's uh, the only uh, triple syllabled word. What is it? Trisyllabic word, I know. So I try to use it in every interview. Well, it's not the first time in my life I've been called extremely special, mostly by teachers. Aw. <laughs> Well, That's have you ever a comedy been, writer? <laughs> I've never been called trisyllabic. Uh, we're starting off with that one. <laughs> uh, first things first, I do want to ask you. This is something I've been wanting to ask you since I started watching Lower Decks. By the way, I, I saw all of uh, Rick and Morty, great stuff, awesome, as well as Solar Opposites. Uh, but before we even touch any of that stuff. I'm assuming your favorite Deep Space, or your, sorry, that's a Freudian slip there. Your favorite series is Next Generation. Am I right? Or is it Deep Space Nine? I mean, it's, it's tough because I grew up watching Next Gen. And then when I was an adult, I watched all of Deep Space Nine. And I, I think I, it's kind of tough for me because like TNG, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager, they're like a set for me. They're like the, the shows that were airing, you know, right when I was when I was still living at home with my folks when I was a kid and they were all comfort zone for me, you know, but I I'm a Jordy and Data guy. Like that's who I grew up loving and and honestly rewatching Deep Space Nine as an adult, that's when I truly understood how great it was. Um I think when I was a kid, Deep Space Nine, I loved Odo and obviously I loved Jake and I loved the kid access points on Deep Space Nine. Like <laughs> Odo in a bucket, I was like, yeah, sign me up, let's go. And <laughs> you know, as an adult I was like, oh, the Jem'Hadar and the Dominion War and all this cool kind of serialized stuff. Like, I think when I was a kid and when I wasn't in charge of when I got to watch TV, I was seeing that more piecemeal. But when you get to binge all of Deep Space Nine, you're like, all right, this show's fucking awesome. Like, this show gets it, you know? So, uh, so yeah, it's probably TNG first, Deep Space Nine second. But, you know, I love all that era. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of shows, uh, it feels like um, Lower Decks is kind of an homage to uh, Next Generation, which is my favorite series. Although I will say that I think that Deep Space Nine is probably the most superior product of all of the, I mean, just the writing is just unbelievable. I mean, it's just the best writing in my opinion, but Next Generation is kind of the one that, that grabbed my heart first. And it seems like Lower Decks is an homage to that. Or do you feel like, it's more of an homage to all of Star Trek or specifically like the, the three nineties Star Trek series. It's funny when I was first pitching uh, lower decks, I didn't know. And actually I didn't even get to pitch it at first. It was really just came from a conversation I had with, with Kurtzman and the other, and the other secret hideout folks is I didn't know what I was going to get to play with because I was watching discovery and I knew Picard was on the way. And I was like, my dream was to, reverse time and get to do one more TNG era show. Mm -hmm. And I was like, but are they going to let me do that? So for a while I was trying to get used to the thought that like Lower Decks might have to be a, a show about Star Trek that took place during the disco era. And I was wrapping my head around that because I, I like discovery, but I, I like live and breathe TNG. Like I get, like I can talk about TNG like it happened to me because I grew up watching it and seeing it so much. <laughs> and and it felt like it would have been a little bit more of a challenge to do my own kind of version of Lower Decks in the Discovery era. But then, you know, in conversations with them, when I found out that I got to create a new ship, a new Starfleet ship in 2380, and, and that I got to use kind of some of the visual lexicon of that era and that kind of storytelling, like, that, yeah, you know, my first, my first inclination was what is my TNG ship? What feels like, you know, on, on Lower Decks, the stars are the, are the ensigns, right? And so for that to work, part of what's helpful is that the bridge crew is really recognizable because we're not spending a lot of time with them. Mm -hmm. So I wanted you to get from like a thousand yards away what the bridge crew is all about, what the captain's like, what her first officer's like, you know, what her head of security's like. Those are broad strokes characters. And the characters that are, are leads that have more facets that are, you know, that at least at the very get go are the ones that we are building out are the ensigns. And so taking that TNG sort of vibe and putting that bridge crew together, you know, D Space Nine is complex. And TNG had to be like, hey, this is new Star Trek. 
this isn't TOS, but it's got aspects of it that are going to be familiar. D Space Nine got to be its entirely own thing. Like it's it's not even on a Federation station. You know, mm. like that's really cool. But you kind of don't get that without TNG. And so those elements of familiarity with TNG are what I built the Cerritos kind of loosely around. That being said, there's something that's so like we're constantly in the writer's room talking about how can we get onto Deep Space Nine? What's going to make sense? And we saw it for a second in a flashback this first we season. We did. And I'm always like, I feel like Mariner would love Quark. Like she would just get it. Like <laughs> totally. They would get blitzed and wake up somewhere and have to find their key. Like there are entire <laughs> movies about other people like, like Quark and Mariner could be trying to get to a White Castle or dudes where my caring. You know what I mean? Like they, I feel like they would be to some extent simpatico. Um, and, you know, as we've been going, especially because we've, it's hard for me to separate. I've got all of season two written as well uh, and that we're working on for Lower Decks. And the first season is kind of like, we're playing the hits. Like let's do our trial episode. Let's do our version of a movie. Uh, let's do a plague on the ship. Uh, let's, you know, let's do all these things that, that, that I love that feel like familiar area for next gen stories. But then second season, we start to bridge into D space nines type stories and Voyager type stories. And, and even like an enterprise type story, like what's lucky for me comedically is that there's so much material to, to love and to dive into that that on another Star Trek show, on a dramatic Star Trek show, you look at all these 700 episodes of Star Trek and it's kind of like, well, fuck, what the fuck are we supposed to do? You know, like everything's been done. Wait, am I allowed to swear on this podcast, by the way? I think so. Oh, yeah. Ciroc's okay, got sorry. a filthy mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's a reporter, you know. Um, but, uh, but, you know, when you're writing a dramatic Star Trek, it's like you don't want to tread territory that people have already seen, Right. But for us, because we're looking at it from a different angle, those existing episodes become mythologically broad existing things for us to use and look at in a different way. And so first season, yes, it's a lot of TNG. But as second season, we start to delve into other mythologically broad areas. And hopefully if we get picked up for more seasons, we'll just, you know, we'll have all of this material that we keep getting to kind of explore and be like, well, what would the lower deckers have been doing during that? Mm. Well, um, I know Ryan, you have a ton of questions, but I want to get it in there that first of all, I love your show doing Thank a fantastic you. job. Uh, really one of the best first seasons of any star Trek show. I mean, it gets right into it and it hits the ground running in my opinion. So kudos to you. That's Thank right. And Mike, um, I do want to say that Ciroc has said that before today. He actually publicly said about that other shows. About, no, about uh, only no, like about four or five show. of them. Okay, good. Oh, but he did oh, say oh. it. I thought you had me going for a second. I thought he said <laughs> no, that about, about show, Ted Lasso. About this show. No, no. I, well, I haven't seen as much Star Trek as you, and clearly that's evident by the body of work and the references that you make in the material. So that's that's one thing I think is. Uh, really pleasant for the fans to have is those little golden nuggets where they get to say, Hey, he mentioned more. If he mentioned this, he mentioned O'Brien people like that. Um, I also want to say, and you know, which character out of these characters do you feel like is the one that you like the most or, or represents you the most or just closest to you? Oh, uh, that's uh -oh. interesting yeah. because I have, here's the thing is like, <laughs> I, I think I would love to say Mariner because she's awesome. And I just don't think I'm a Mariner though. Every character to some extent. I mean, I worked in, in Hollywood, I guess, so to speak for like 11 years before I got my first writing job. And I was writing at home all the time. I was, I was getting people coffee. I was working as an assistant. I was a production assistant. I was a writer's assistant. Like I did a lot of lower decks jobs before I started moving up and getting to do the kind of stuff I wanted to do. And mm -hmm. I, I think it different, you know, when you do something for a decade, you are different people. Like you change as you go, as you're growing up and as, as you're experiencing different stuff, you're getting more experience. And I think to some extent, like when I first started, I was attendee, like everything was amazing. I, there was literally like, I was a PA at South Park and there was nothing that I had to do that sucked. Clean the bathrooms today. Fuck yeah, let's go. I'm <laughs> at South Park, you know? And, and then, yeah you know, for, for some of it, I was like Mariner, you know, like this is bullshit. I should do what I want. I can do this better. You have that kind of like bravado of youth that you think everything 
that you think you have a better way of doing stuff. Um, mm-hmm. I know how to use Photoshop. Why are we using whiteout strips on this thing? Like, <laughs> um, and then other times I was like Rutherford, you know, where it's like you come into a room and, and you're brand new and you know how to use technology and, and you're learning the old way, but you're also bringing in the new way. And, and then probably, unfortunately, I'm the most like Boimler because I'm, I'm super excited to be there. I get in my own way. I talk a little bit too much. I know what I'm doing, but I get under my own feet a little bit. I trip myself up Mm -hmm. and that you have to like, like Boimler, I had to find people like Mariner and like the other folks on the ship that you have to extend this trust. Like it can't all be on you. You can't be your own worst enemy all the time. Um, So I probably mostly like Boimler. I used to get made fun of at Rick and Morty that I loved working at Rick and Morty so much that they called me the ray of sunshine because I love, obviously Aww. I love sci-fi comedy and that was from a group of comedy writers, uh, a big diss on me. Um, and I think that's partially where Teddy comes from. But uh, but yeah, I think I'm probably a Boimler. Like, you know, I, I get my own way and I'm excited to be there and I want, I'm a people pleaser and I want people to like me and and he has better hair than me, even if it's purple, but I think I'm probably around there. <laughs> you know, hearing you talk about the characters, it makes me think like, was there was there a character that you wanted to create or one or two or three kinds of characters you wanted to create that you kind of just had to scrap? You had to whittle it down to the four main characters or did you just have four characters in mind already and just kind of develop them? Um, you know, it was interesting. All the characters came from the very initial problem of how do you stay Starfleet but also have conflict within the characters? Because... And that's been a Roddenberry thing from the very get-go. Like, he was like, there should never be conflict in these characters, but it's a workplace show, you know? I mean, it's a sci-fi show, and it's about ethics and morals and exploration and personal truths and, and sci-fi truths and all this cool stuff. And, and yeah, sometimes, like, a glowing orb sh- shows up and makes everybody want to fuck each other. But, like, <laughs> at, at the very core, like, the thing that really attracts me to storytelling in Star Trek is how just wide-eyed supportive everybody is of everybody else just Mm -hmm. that that from you've got data that's 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 trying to be human and you've got Worf who's trying to be Klingon and is maybe a little too human and you've got all of these different characters you've got Wesley and you've got O'Brien and you've got Cisco you've got both Cisco's and it's all these characters are so supportive of each other that you have to add characters in what you might call like dramatic Star Trek because I do comedy Star Trek where it's like, oh, you have Quark and you have Odo. And it's like, hey, I get why those two wouldn't get along. They're not Starfleet too, which is really helpful, right? Mm-hmm. And then you have like Bashir who's got some sort of like secrets going on from his parents and you start to build stuff out a little bit. But for me at the very beginning, I was like, I don't know how to do comedy unless there's at least some conflict going on with these characters. And Mm -hmm. what I personally really like to write is comedies where people want the same thing, but they go about it in different ways. So you have two characters that are like, wow, we really want to do Starfleet stuff, but I want to do it in my seat of my pants, breaking the rules, Mariner style, and Boimler wants to follow all the rules. And they're both kind of wrong. You know, like if you're, Mm -hmm. if you're being, if you're committing to this one way and that you're not flexible, then that's going to end up kind of, you know, undermining you. And that's why those kind of conflicts work well against each other. And at the same time, they still feel Starfleet because, you know, they still are trying to do their best and they're still being supportive. It's just, they have, they have almost scientifically different philosophies on how to get it done. Right. And so, when I was building the characters out, I was like, okay, I know I need a Jordi and a Data. Like, that's Tendi and Rutherford. Like, they're kind of, they're not in a will they or won't they. They're like in a nerd they or won't they because they love geeking out <laughs> over the ship so much. And then, you know, Boimler and Mariner, it's like Spock and Kirk if you don't know which one is which, you know? Right. Or it might even be like Kirk and Picard. Like, Mariner's kind of a Kirk and Boimler's kind of like a Picard before he got stabbed in the heart by Nausicaa's, you know? Like, he's kind of like a proto-Picard. Right. And that's tapestry, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Ciroc knows I'm always talking about oh, that yes. episode. We actually had one of our friends, uh, Casey Shafsky, actually send me a Lieutenant Picard action figure. I got it right back oh, there. Dope. So that's kind of our mascot right now. So that's an action back. figure that has its that has it's the only time Picard had his real heart, you know? That's a real yeah. throwback. And it's got <laughs> it's got meaning 
for life in that in that episode. <laughs> yeah. he, said, he says he doesn't want to be that guy bereft of, you know, whatever he says. I just like that he said bereft. Anyway, please continue. <laughs> well, so so building out, you know, where are the comedic stakes coming from? I knew I wanted like Tendy was a ball of absolute optimism. Rutherford went through it wasn't until I wrote the pilot that I realized that Rutherford was in a romance with the ship and that that was like, Mm. he's almost like every episode he's finding, like it's hard for him to balance his life with how much he loves being on a starship. And I think that that's kind of a work-life balance sort of problem that I think a lot of people have. And I'm not sure that that's been seen in Star Trek before. I'm sure there's a thousand people spitting out their ramen right now being like, bullshit, we've seen that. It's probably on Voyager. Um, It's probably Bellana. Uh, (laughs) <laughs> and and yeah you know you just when you're creating a show like you want to come up with characters that feel that feel textured and that feel honest but that also feel like you know we weren't trying to do a parody of Star Trek we were trying to do something that surprisingly had a bunch of jokes was half the length in sh- runtime of a Star Trek mm-hmm. but that had three stories in it an A story a B story and like a C background runner that gave you a full Star Trek episode in it so you know I feel like something that we're always going to be working on in this show is how fast do people have to talk? How many jokes do we have to get in there? How many plots do we have to get in there? Sometimes some plots can be a little slower. Sometimes they have to be so breakneck. Just, you know, people are like, oh, there's a, mis- there's a misunderstanding about animation and about the streaming networks where it's like, if you're on streaming, why can't it just be an hour long? And it's like, well, in animation, every single right. movement is being created and drawn and, and designed. And so every minute of animation is extremely expensive. And, and once you get it done, it's really hard to change it. So, you know, we have to try to, we have to try to be careful with how many minutes that if we go over a minute, it's outrageously expensive. So, you know, animation has a lot of constrictions and, and restrictions, but at the same time, we get to have a lot of fun that nobody else gets to have. So it's all worth it. I feel like I'm rambling now. What were we talking about? The characters? The we characters love it, though. This is good stuff. <laughs> no, 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 we love it. We love it. And actually, I wanted to say something a little bit about that. I feel like you don't have the, as many restrictions because you have animation and you're able to do a lot more with it. Um, uh, and, and therefore, you're able to travel to different planets and, and have different sets that you wouldn't necessarily be able to build out for it with a, with a very limited uh, budget. Right. Yeah. Um, does that feel like you have that? And also, can you tell us a little bit about the process, uh, the, how the recording is done? And are, are you filming all together? Are you meeting up together for table reads? Or are you just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, every animation, every animated show is different because I know that some of those like big Fox primetime shows do a table read every episode. We've only ever done one to try to okay. get all the actors in the room once together to kind of get the vibe of the show all together. And then mm-hmm. everything else is recorded separately, especially now... You know, during COVID, we've done everything remote for half of first season and all of second season so far. Um, But I mean, it's uniquely suited. Like, you know, we record people in their homes. We just create like a sound environment that like, you know, doesn't have too many echoes. And we just moved everybody's workstations home so all of our artists can work from, you know, from where they were safely being at home anyway. Um, It's funny, the... Yes, you are right. To some extent, animation does give us the freedom to do stuff like, you know, go to places that maybe a set wouldn't, wouldn't allow us to do. And I remember because, you know, our, our producers on this show are from Discovery and they were, and Picard, and they were really excited. This was their first animated show. And they were like, you can put the camera anywhere like they were like that's awesome and and it's so funny because i was like i came into it and i was like my perspective on it was okay because you can put it anywhere where you put it becomes insanely more important than on a live action show because our biggest hurdle coming into this was how do we make it look star trek while also being new and so there was a lot of conversation about yeah, we can put the camera anywhere we want. We can go anywhere we want. But if we start doing that, when does it stop being Star Trek? When does it start being another type of show? Mm-hmm. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of talking and walking and inhabiting the Cerritos. The, the environments in the Cerritos are intentionally designed to mimic, you know, the, 
the shot setups in TNG, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager because we wanted the look and the feel of the show to feel like it came from the same production limitations that those shows came from. Another aspect of that is aliens. Like we don't, we can do whatever we want with aliens. They can be pencil exactly. thin or they can be as wide as a room. Right. But we do do that sometimes, but 99% of the time we want them to look like somebody had to sit and make up for eight hours to do that because that's what Star Trek looks like. And yeah. We end up earning these kind of crazy animation moments that you otherwise wouldn't be able to get. There was a real, like, uh, the first shot of the first episode or the first scene involved Mariner pulling out a batleth and drunkenly cutting open Boimler's leg. Right. And a lot of people saw that and they were like, ooh, I don't know. That's, that doesn't feel Star Trek to me. That might be too <laughs> violent. That might be too goofy. <laughs> And for me, that was a mission statement for, I was like, that has to be right up at the top because in this show, there's occasionally going to be violence. But also in this show, there's going to be batleths that are designed to look exactly like a batleth that you would see in Deep Space Nine or Voyager or whatever. And that batleth is going to be dangerous. That for the first time, because these are animated characters, you're going to see how fucked up you could get if somebody swung a batleth at you. Because in live action, you don't get to carve into somebody's leg with a bat left. But in animation, you know, I remember sitting with the sound designers and choosing the sound that the bat left made as it ripped through the carpet when Mariner accidentally lets it touch the carpet. And it has weight and it sounds scary. And I was like, I want that bat left to be fucking scary. And that's why we chose that first scene is if you look at the staging of that scene, it looks like it could be pulled right from TNG, right from Voyager or Deep Space Nine. It's, it's framed and it's in an environment and the costumes and the lighting even and the types of computers, everything looks like it's directly from that. And then this completely incongruous moment of the Batleth going through somebody's leg and them screaming and then it goes to the main title. That was the mix for me of, hey, this looks exactly like you expect it to, but it's also going to do things you don't expect. And right. so a lot of the freedom of animation was... You know, a lot of people love that moment and a lot of people hate that moment. And it's like, you can't please everybody. Like people love, people more than love Star Trek. They have a emotional, <laughs> deep relationship to it. And so do I. Otherwise, I wouldn't be trying to make a Star Trek show. And I get it. And I think that, you know, you don't want to betray anybody, but you do have to do something new. You know, like Deep Space Nine had to do something new. Voyager did something new. Enterprise, every one of these shows does something new. It's always... Is doing, do you, are you doing something new without betraying the Star Trek ishness of it? And for me, Lower Decks doesn't betray Star Trek. I mean, we bend Star Trek rules. We're obviously a comedy, but at its heart, this show is Star Trek. And everything from the design choices to the, the music to, the, to the, the, you know, the words that the characters are saying, uh, we get a lot of people being like, wow, there's a lot of references in, in this show. Mm -hmm. And some people misunderstand and think that we think that the references are funny. We don't think the references are funny. We feel like criminals who have gotten away with getting to do a Star Trek show and, if, <laughs> and that the Lower Deckers would be huge <laughs> fans of all the stuff that happened in Starfleet. They'd be learning about it at the Academy. They'd be reading the logs. And this show is a celebration of all Star Trek stuff for the characters in it and for the audience watching it and for the guys writing it. Um, and so, you know, we almost feel like we're like, oh, oh crap, we, we did it. We got a Star Trek show. Let's have as much fun as possible in it. Like all these references for us, it's, it's world building. Like these are mm -hmm. animated two-dimensional characters. How could they not be excited about Gorn? Like if they know everything about this <laughs> ship, they would know everything about Starfleet. I think the one time we bend the rules is I think it's really funny and I'm sure a lot of people don't think it's funny where the characters are referring to events in Starfleet by the episode names from <laughs> other series. So like there's a character who's like, I'm half a rascal from the episode Rascals. But to me, it's kind of like, <laughs> well, maybe there's logs that, you know, maybe people titled their logs or maybe it's like it was something <laughs> that was referenced it feels like you can make the episode titles diegetic because Star Trek fans love their titles, you know? And it just felt like getting something like that in there was fun to us. But anyway, the limitations of animation 
are definitely balanced out with making it feel like a real Star Trek. You know, your answers are so good that you give us like 10 juicy nuggets in every answer. And I want to <laughs> jump on every one of them. Uh, so I'll just pick two very quickly. One is you mentioned the music. That theme song is... Oh, thank yeah, you. I love, I love it. I love it. We love that. Yeah. There was so much thought put into that. And we really appreciate that. It's, you really nailed it. Not just... Thank you. Not just... Well, Chris Westlake nailed it. He, he is... Right. Uh, He's a close friend of mine, a brilliant composer. He usually does features. Mm. And I begged him to work on Solar Opposites, and we had a blast. And then in Solar Opposites, there's this big movie episode that's like, it's a in standalone the, episode. In the wall, right? In the wall. That's one of the best got, ever. Thank you. And we got a 60-person live orchestra for that wall, and it's all originally composed music. And then that was our, that was our blueprint for what the music on Lower Decks is like. Because we also have a 60-person orchestra for every episode of Lower Decks. But then COVID hit, so we record them individually at their own homes and studios and then stitch it all together. So it sounds amazing, but the amount of work that's happening that makes it seem effortless is insane. Um, I do love that theme song. I, I think it's the only... Star Trek theme that has a chorus that comes in behind it. That's like, ah, like so that makes me laugh every time. I love it. There, Cause the, there's like references to and homages to Star Trek in the theme song. And it sounds like it's own, but anyway, you know why it's great, but so do we, it's, it's amazing. It really came through and people really like it. I know Thank we you. do, um, but something you said earlier that I've really been wanting to ask, and it's kind of a left turn, but you just mentioned being a writer's assistant. And some of us, you know, we all know it's, it's a pretty tough gig moving up in the writer's world. And a lot of people try to do it for 20 or 30 years and don't never get to where they'd like to be. And I was kind of wondering, how did you get that first jump from writer's PA to writer's assistant or writer's assistant to in a writer's mm -hmm. room? I mean, because it's sometimes you get lucky and other times you're working at it for 20 years. I think everybody, everybody has the same path. It's just different. It looks different from far away. But like, basically, I think my advice to anybody that wants to do that is this is how it worked for me. Is I, when I first moved out here, I didn't know if I wanted to be a writer or if I wanted to be a director. I knew I didn't want to be an actor. But I, I knew what I wanted to do was make stuff. Like that was the headline. I wanted to make stuff. And I, I desperately wanted to be a writer, but I think like many writers, I think I'm a hack and an idiot and who would want to read my writing? Every um, writer thinks that. I hope so, because it's all true. <laughs> we all suck. The, um, I, I've worked with a couple actually great writers and it's always the worst because they're so good. And then you're like, fuck. <laughs> um, and then you just aspire and aspire. But what I did was, you know, when I was talking about how I worked all those lower decker gigs is I was always excited to be doing anything on shows to see how they actually got made because every show is different. Mm -hmm. So I was, I worked in as an intern in movies for a minute that just got a little bit on my resume that said, Hey, this guy has worked at all. And then I was a production assistant on drawn together, which was an animated show on comedy central right. and then on South park. And then the South, while I was there, Matt and Trey were writing and making Book of Mormon. And then they got so into that that they stopped making movies. So the head of their, their producer who was in charge of making movies had less to do. And so she ended up getting hired to become the head of animation at Fox and knew me as a production assistant at South Park and took me to be her assistant there. So when I was an assistant, I think I was there for like three, maybe over three years, which is a really long time to be an assistant. But while I was there, every night went home and wrote. Every lunch read and wrote. Went to other departments there. Went to live action comedy. Guys, give me scripts to read. And not just scripts that they're making for air. Give me the scripts that you guys read that came in that made you go, we have to meet with the writer who wrote this. Like That's mm -hmm. all I wanted. And from there, working there, two important things happened is I met Justin Roiland, who we developed with for a while, and we talked about video games a lot. <laughs> and I learned that the best scripts for me to write were scripts that were very readable. 
that were fun to be read, that you don't need something that can be made. You need something that is short, that is, it gets into the story quickly. I could talk about this forever, whatever. I learned how to write to be read and it was great. So I started writing to be read as opposed to be, you know, as opposed to what I thought was supposed to be written. And I, uh, I ended up, uh, a show got, as sometimes happens, a show got picked up uh, called Out There for uh, IFC. And I went there and I became a writer's assistant for that show. And then Rick and Morty that got the pilot picked up and they, Adult Swim was picking up two scripts to be written to prove that Rick and Morty should be picked up to series. And they needed a writer's assistant. And so Justin emailed me and said, hey, watch this pilot. If you're into this, do you want to come and be our writer's assistant on this? It might only be a two-week gig. So I watched the Rick and Morty pilot and I was just like blown away. Like that was my perfect pilot. And I, yeah. anytime somebody says that they don't like that pilot, I just want to shake them and be like, you don't know how hard pilots are. Like the Rick and Morty pilot so effortlessly is funny and sets up the tone and the dynamic of that show. I just lost my mind. Like I thought it was amazing. And so at the very beginning of Rick and Morty, it was Justin Roiland, Dan Harmon, Ryan Ridley, and me. And it was us sitting in a room every day, me taking notes and occasionally like fearfully pitching a joke. And (laughs) the four of us wrote, the Lawnmower Dog episode and the Rick Potion number nine episode, which is what mm-hmm. how the show got picked up and to a full series. And then from there, I became writer's assistant on the full first season. And then I got to write an episode at the end of that season because I'd been, you know, working with the guys long enough that they kind of recognized that I was a big sci-fi geek and a comedy geek and that I could do it. Second season, I got moved up. And then eventually by fourth season, uh, I was showrunner because mm-hmm. I just, you know, I really, I really got, you know, I liked Dan and Justin's vision for the show and I really liked writing the show. I really liked that stuff. And the only reason that I'm not still there, I think is because I sold solar opposites and star Trek at the exact same time. So then I concurrently at one point started staffing star Trek. I was show running Rick and Morty and concurrently show running solar solar shares basically a wall in the same office as Rick and Morty. And then I had to part ways with, with Rick and Morty to start, Basically, we write Star Trek when Solar Opposites is being animated. And then when Star Trek is being animated, I write a new season of Solar Opposites. And it just goes back and forth like that. And I've been doing that for a couple of years now. But I think that the... So that's the long-winded Mike McMahon's talking too much version of it. But I think that the, the headlines for people out there are that you need to be working to some extent on the stuff you want to work on. And if you can't work exactly on that stuff, you need to work on stuff that you like that's adjacent to it or is from people who worked on stuff you liked before. Mm -hmm. Because what that will do is, you know, the, the opportunities will come to you. You just have to make sure that you are prepared to grab them when they come. Because there was one moment I remember where somebody was like, hey, will you help us on this script? And I fucked it up. And they were like, yeah, no thanks. And I I viscerally (laughs) was like, I can never fuck that up again. That doesn't happen too often. And the, you know, the going home and writing and the tons of reading, like the one note that I would ask for people and the one note that I'll give to people now is, this is the page I stopped reading on. This is the line I stopped reading on. And here's why. Because if somebody will stop, if somebody stops reading your script for any reason, then who fucking cares how great it is 10 pages later? Like they're just out, you know? And so I started just trying to write scripts that you got all the way through and that the worst note you could get was, I wouldn't mind if this was slightly longer, you know, like great note, I'll write three more pages. (laughs) Um, And so, you know, having your writing ready, having, figuring out what your voice as a writer is, which sounds impossible, but translated that just means what could you just, sit down and write and never get sick of it. Like what kind of stories do you like to write? And then being brave enough to be like, even like, you know, there was a long time where people were like, stop writing shows that take place on spaceships, man. Like, what are you doing? Those are hard to make. And I don't listen to them. Yeah. I was like, sorry, but they make me laugh. Like that's what I like to do. And even to this day, my manager loves telling the story where the first note she gave me on my first sci-fi script, she was like, why does this have to take place in a spaceship? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, and you know 
she slowly just understood that like, that's what gets me excited. So, you know, I mean, it's corny, but like being true to what you like to do, learning from the people around you, working with people that are better than you, and then, you know, not giving up and opening yourself to opportunities that you believe in. Like nobody knew Rick and Morty was going to be awesome. Like I knew when I saw that pilot, you know, like that really spoke to me. And Mm -hmm. I thought that I could help make it at least 1% better with my, with my, like my joy for it, you know? And if you approach everything like that, you know, turn down stuff that like, if you're going to get a writer's assistant gig, like you can get trapped in writer's assistant gigs too. Like if you don't have joy for what you're working in. Um, but lots of writing on your own, lots of write, writing that is made to be read, not as made to be produced unless you're going to produce it on your own. And then Godspeed, I think that's awesome too. Um, and then just working with people that you really respect so that when the opportunities arise, those opportunities are coming from people that you, that make the kind of stuff that you want to make. Awesome. Yeah. Rock, I know you got a question. We only have a few minutes left, but go ahead and hit them with it. Well, I, uh, you know, once again, kudos to you. I, I didn't realize you had so much uh, experience and that you were actually <laughs> earned your lower decks credentials yourself. So that's, uh, <laughs> Thank you, man. That's pretty amazing. Um, that was field research. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I can write all those years off. <laughs> oh, it's, it's great. It's, it's great. So keep up the good work. We really like where you're going with this, with this show. But I did want to say that um, just recently I spoke with a woman by the name of Kennedy who has a show called uh, Women at Warp, and she's a black woman. And one of the things that she said in our conversation was, she loved Mariner so much because it was like her. It was a sassy black girl who was confident <laughs> and smart. And she was finally seeing somebody that represented her. And I just wanted you to speak to that a little bit. Absolutely. Um, so the one thing I knew about the casting of this show was that it needed to not be bland. It needed to not be, it, it needed to be vibrant, whatever that meant. You know what I mean? And what that meant is when we when I was writing these characters, I didn't have anybody in mind specifically for them and I didn't have any one kind of ethnicity or racial background to any of them. Like I didn't know that Mariner was going to end up being black until I met Tony Newsom. Like when mm. we were casting Mariner, we were meeting with with Asian actresses and uh, Latina, Latinx actresses and black actresses. And, you know, I just knew that, you know, I really wanted somebody that, that brought sort of a, a tone and a personality to it that felt like I would have to write up to them. Not that I was writing it because, you know, I'm about as white as they come. You know what I mean? Like I, I do not, I do not bring that to it. I bring a lot of nerdiness to it. I bring a lot of passion, but uh, I'm a pretty white dude. And when I, when we auditioned Tawny Newsom, within seconds, she set the entire tone for the show. Mm-hmm. Like she was the first person that we cast. She was the first person who, when she was rambling about, I said to her in the audition, I was like, hey, will you just ramble about things that you love from Star Trek, the next generation, her rambling became the end of the first episode. Like that, that made it into that. And her growing up with, and just having TNG be a part of her life growing up, like, and her just, her general kind of like, I mean, she's an amazing actress and she's beyond funny. She's insanely funny, but just, the vibrancy and the fun and the, and the confidence and just everything she brings to that role is, the, you know, Tani Newsom is that, that spark that then built the fire into finding Jack Quaid and finding Noel Wells and finding Eugene. Oh God. Eugene Cordero is again, like a sleeper hit who plays Rutherford is so funny. Just every one of these actors, you know, can take, something written funny and then they say it and it's so much funnier because of the way they right. choose to do it. And we try to get out of their way a lot. We try to get like, you know, we do three takes and then we have them do a couple takes and we're like, all right, now just change it. Like, what do you want to say here? You know what I mean? And, mm-hmm. but I think what your friend is identifying is that Tony Newsom is a force, you know, 
Like yeah. Tanya Newsom is is one of the most fun and awesome actors I've ever worked with. And, you know, even in cartoon form, that comes like blazing through. And Absolutely. and it it ricochets across everything like the tone of joy and of fun that she brought to it and just her voice and how she speaks. like we even you know she was on my radar not even from casting i'm sure my casting folks would 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 shake their fists at me but <laughs> we auditioned tawny because uh one of my producers brad winters is a huge fan of her yo is this racist podcast and was like you should have her read and she came in and just blew us away like she wasn't even you know, she wasn't even through the usual, the usual kind of process. Um, and I'm just really lucky. Like, I'm really, really lucky. I keep being afraid that she's going to become like the next Tom Cruise and like disappear and be a huge superstar because like her star power, like, you know, gives me a tan whenever I'm around her. She shines so bright. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I wish I could take credit for that. I think like, Tawny as a guiding light really builds out a lot of Mariner. It really edified a lot of, you know, Don Lewis who plays the captain again is like mm-hmm. amazing at that role and, and so singular and, you know, Don and Tawny together are like truly a joy, like so funny and so combative. And when they get along is even better and they're not combative in real life. I mean, on screen, like they're, they're <laughs> yeah. best pals in real life, but the, you know, just having that baseline and trusting and knowing when something is better than I could have done it, like letting, letting, con- letting go of the controls a little bit and just like whatever, whatever's making Tawny laugh is going to be the funny thing, you know, like letting, letting Tawny improvise in the booth a little bit and making sure it's all there and then like feeding lines and like playing around with it, you know? So I, I have to give a lot of credit to Tawny and, and really the whole cast. Like it's yeah. a really fun, really vibrant cast, like not only just vocally, but just like, personality wise, like that's what they feel like in real life. You know, like going out to dinner with those guys feels like you're hanging out with Mariner and Boimler and Tendi and Rutherford. Like it's just, it's just really awesome. So I wish I could take credit for that kind of stuff. But I think the only thing I'll take credit for is knowing that if I had tried specifically to be like, I know the best thing to do here, Mm. it probably would have felt like it would have felt like a little less exciting you know, whoever I had cast would have had a harder job because when we found Tawny, I was like, oh, this is, I had no idea Tawny was out there. She's a hundred percent right. And then let's build off of there. Like being open to that kind of stuff. Like that's, I guess that's part of the fun of making a show, but you know, it's, it's the scary part. Cause then you also have to listen to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of auditions and you have to have people be like, maybe you just don't know what you're doing. And you're like, maybe I just haven't heard the right person yet. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, when you find, I mean, sir, I, I mean, both of you guys must know, like when you find that person who, who it's a synthesis, like it's not just that they're executing a script, but that they're like, there's this kind of like alchemy where you don't, right. you, they, it could have been done, but this is better than that. It's like kind of breathing life into it. Like mm-hmm. when you find somebody like that, you're just so lucky, and and that's what this whole cast did, and especially Tawny at the very get go. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. Cool. I've I've often told people from the other side of the table, uh, you know, when you're an actor, you always feel like the other person, you know, the the producers or whatever, almost like almost like the enemy. It's like a scary thing. But from the producer's point of view, you're you're rooting for that. You're you're saying, please be the person that I'm looking for, you know, everybody that's walking here, just like, please. And it's just the person that comes out and just brings whatever they are as a person to you. Uh, that's the person that is going to send you home to lunch finally or, or whatever. Yeah. It's uh, weird too, to have to tell a room full of producers. They're like, what are you looking for? And you're like, I'm looking for somebody funny who sounds super fucking Starfleet. And they're like, what does that even mean? <laughs> I'll, I don't know, but I'll know it when I see it or hear it. Yeah. Uh, that's so, great. I know you got to go. Uh, you did answer a previous question of mine too, without me having to ask it. So thank you. Which was, uh, it does seem like you stay open to letting the actors improvise certain lines here or there, and it seems like that's what you kind of implied is that you you give your first three takes, and then you said you let people kind of improvise something or throw something out that they want to do, and it really shows. It makes it feel extremely natural, 
and it seems less rigid and scripted and more like you're just watching actual people talking because I think that that's what this show is going for, realism. Like, these are real people. They're not these model citizens quite yet. They're just you, like you and me. Um, and Yeah, they're like us plus, I think. I think, yeah. I think I didn't know this when I started, but that it made a lot of sense, is that I wanted to see... Like, I think if you're a Star Trek fan, you're probably, you're probably a good person. Like, people who like Star Trek usually sort of... It, I mean, you've heard this forever. It's like, this is where this is where people get into the sciences. This is where people find hope. This is where people, you know, get excited about stories about morality and ethics. You know what I mean? And also about friendship. And it got me excited to do a show where the characters in the show are also Star Trek fans because they're not the bridge crew. And like I was saying about my... In quotes, my journey as a writer. But, you know, I only worked places where I was a fan. Like when I was at South Park, you know, when I'm putting printer paper into a printer, I'm not doing that because I love printers. Like I'm doing that because I love laughing and watching South Park and I want to be a part of it. And I really think that a lot of that attitude got into Lower Decks where these characters love. Starfleet and they love the history of the Federation and they love, they might not love their day to day jobs, but they love being a part of the bigger story. They love being a little part of it, just being a part of it at all. And to different extents, like clearly Mariner and Tendi are very different in how they view, you know, their experiences. But I, I just, you know, I really wanted that aspect of being a Trekkie to get into Star Trek. That felt like, if Deep Space Nine is about, you know, being on a on a retrofitted Cardassian space station, by the way, so many times I have to tell my artists, guys, don't take design cues from Deep Space Nine. And they're like, why not? You don't like Deep Space I'm like, I love space, Deep Space Nine, but it's not Federation shit. Like, <laughs> the, uh, but, and they know that now. They're great. The, um, but that the, you know, wanting to get that feeling into the show felt like my, this is on a space station. Like if you're going to do a Star Trek with actual Trekkies in it who love what they do and they might not be the best of the best yet, but they're trying and it is important to them at a baseline. They're all the best. They're like, they are good people at heart. You know, that aspect of this show is way more important to me than the idea that it's about the lower decks. I mean, there's an episode of TNG called The Lower Decks that's my favorite. Like that's, that's one of the clearly best ever. my inspiration for this. You know what I mean? But that being said, well, that's the kind of baseline inspiration of and there's been other Star Trek episodes. Like there's a Voyager Lower Decks type episode. And, you know, you could even say that like Jake and Nogger Lower Decks. You know what I mean? Like every every Star Trek has kind of looked at that. But the for me, it's if we're gonna do a comedy about Star Trek, let's put four characters that if you ran into them at a Star Trek convention you would just be so pumped to like talk about the warp core with them that that's cool to them because that's cool to us and having a show that says, you know, Hey, you, you know, your fantasy might be getting to serve on the enterprise, but how about a show where we watch like where that actually gets to happen, like a fan of star Trek and star Trek, you know, and that's, that's what every day when we sit down to write this show, like partially that's why it's so fun. Is because we know the characters love being there. There's nobody that doesn't want to be doing that stuff, and then and then the stories get to like throw them for a loop and stuff. But yeah, that's that's really a joy for me. Mm. Uh, really quickly, I, I know we got to go, but I just want to know really quickly: Have you been sure. to a Star Trek convention before? That was what I was going to ask. I was like, but we're out of time. I shouldn't yeah. ask him that. Uh, no, 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 I can't no, answer that. He does seem like the kind of guy that we would hang out at a Star Trek convention yeah. where he do feel like one of us so bad. So we'd love to know the answer. I so growing up, my family was not very big on conventions, so I didn't get to go to a convention until I was. I had enough money to pay for me to go to the convention. Part of it was that my mom was just like, did not understand that world at all. And then my dad, he had polio and couldn't walk. So like conventions were not great for him. I know a lot of people would say there's him personally didn't love being stuck in the middle of a room where he couldn't get around as much, which I totally get. And so my first Star Trek convention 
was last year to be there wow. and to and to promote and talk about Lower Decks to a room full of people that did not want to hear about a Star Trek cartoon. But I believe by the end of us talking about it, you know, I took some writers with me and they were like, what do you want to talk about? And I was like, let's just get up there and tell them that we love this show and that we love Star Trek and, 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 and it's going to be fun, you know? And I didn't know, like I'd been to Comic-Con many, many times, partially because it's in San Diego and I'd go for work all the time. So it was like such a quick pop down there. And but I had no idea what a party Trek Vegas was that like awesome. panels it's during the, the day, the fine. World. Yeah. But then like, everybody's just like, like, I cannot wait for us to be able to see people in person again and go and just yell Kapla and get trashed with Tawny and some Klingons. Like mm -hmm. that sounds so fun. I just want to be around people who like Worf and, and, my people, you know what I mean? Like, I just like <laughs> that baseline and just, you know, just like how inclusive the whole thing is and just how it's just so startling. You think you know what it's going to be like before you go. And I, it's so not like Comic-Con. Like, I had no idea. Comic-Con feels like it's owned by the brands and Star Trek feels like it's owned by the fans. Like, it's, exactly. Exactly. it's so cool. And it's, it freaks you out when you first get there where you're like, you're like, this could almost just be a fan run event. Like, this is so cool. And, you know, I'm so careful with Star Trek stuff at all times because like, you know, the last thing I want to do is bum somebody out who loves the same thing that I love to like make my job or my life easier. Like, oh, you know, uh, once you get, once, once a decision becomes easy, it's like, well, then maybe we should slow down a little bit. But, you know, I got to relax so much and have such a blast when I went to Star Trek Vegas, that then I was like, God, I can't wait to go this year. And of course the world shut down <laughs> like Stupid after my world. very first taste of it, but <laughs> yeah. I can't wait to go again. And I hope that you guys are going to be there because I, oh, well. I just had such a blast. And I know that everybody from lower decks wants to go and party with everybody and just be like, yeah, we did it. We tricked them into giving us a Star Trek show. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's awesome. awesome. Sirach, he does totally seem like, somebody we'd be hanging out with at Star Trek. You're, you're totally a Star yeah. Trek Las Vegas person. It's the pl greatest place in the world, honestly. I mean, it's you go, you play some blackjack, you get drunk with a bullion. Like, I'm in. Like, that's, <laughs> yes. that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty awesome. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, Mike McMahon, you've been so great to us. You've been an amazing presence online. You're an amazing presence in uh, sci-fi animated comedies, and we really appreciate you taking the time. Hey, thank you for us. having me. Thank you guys for the thank support, Surak. Like, I'm geeking out, man. You're part of the best. <laughs> keep like, keep it up. We, we're watching you, and we're loving what you're doing, man. So keep it up. I hope you still only use one iPad at a time for each thing you're working on, <laughs> just like on Space Nine, because you can't. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know. can't have more than no one internet. book on one iPad. No, yeah, there's no internet. <laughs> um, but yeah, guys, it's been a joy. I, I, I clearly, hopefully, I didn't talk too much. I, I, no, I can talk forever about this stuff, and <clears throat> and I'm really, you know, you think that I'm vo vocal online. Like I love this community. I was a part of it, but I mean, I was writing fake episodes of TNG on Twitter back when I was an assistant called <laughs> TNG season eight. Like I was doing this before anybody was paying me for it. Yeah, <laughs> so I. I feel like I've gotten away with a, a, a wonderful trick and, and, and hopefully I'll, I'll get to keep doing it. Awesome. Uh, we got Norwalk, Diamond Bar, Fresno. I mean, what, what other, what other chip name? <laughs> Sacramento. Uh, you'll be seeing, luckily <laughs> California has a lot of cities in it. Oh yeah. Oh, you know, All the right. St. Louis Obispo. Beautiful vessel. Beautiful. <laughs> Has a whole dedicated ping pong room. You're gonna love it. You know, right <laughs> right before we came yeah. right before you came on, I was telling Sirac I was shooting uh yesterday and he said, Where was it? And I said, Pico Rivera. And he's like, That's the next ship on oh, the That'll be the next like, one. I don't know about Pico I Rivera. I want people man. to be able to drive up and down California and be like, ship, ship, <laughs> ship, <laughs> not a ship. <laughs> yeah. And oh, Barbara. Great. Ooh, ooh. Right. Um, well, thanks well, thank very you guys much, and thank Mike. you for watching. I really appreciate it. We really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Keep it up. Keep up the uh, good work. And everybody at home, we'll see you next time. Keep watching Lower Decks. Sirach did say it's like the best first season ever, but he's a real tough critic with second season, so look out. Uh-oh. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll All do right. it for you, Sirach. Don't worry. We'll see you All next right. time.